afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Steve Cannon, and I'm your VP of Member Development at the Greater Gainesville Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to our first virtual Lunch and Learn. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Car Riggs and Ingram. Uh, Car Riggs and Ingram, they've been sponsoring our Lunch and Learn series now for the past three and a half years, and we have one of their partners here joining us today, Mr. Frank Mason. Frank, how are you doing? Good. How are you, Steve? Good, man. Thanks for sponsoring. Tell us a little bit Very about nice. Car Riggs and Ingram. Yeah, I'll just take a moment. Um, I hope everybody is is able to join the presentation today. Obviously, this is a, a new a new world for all of us. Um, in that regard, um, many businesses today have been challenged in ways that are unprecedented. And if you find yourself in a situation where you're needing some expertise on how to navigate these uncharted waters, please reach out to us. Um, whether you're a client or not, we have resources available on our website, CRICPA.com, that are accessible by all, where you can find different um, tools and tricks to plan for cash flow changes, how to obtain loans, and so on and so forth. So we hope everybody is staying safe and sound, and please reach out to us if we can be of help. And we appreciate you guys uh, supporting this event that we do for our members. Um, Jennifer Webb, I'd like to introduce her. She's delighted, in her exact words, delighted to be here today on our uh, webinar. Jennifer has authored three books on human potential. She has a background and graduate degree in psychology, a master certification in NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming. First time I've ever said that. And uh, 23 years ago in Manhattan. So Jennifer has had the good fortune to work with many organizations like NASA, Apple, Microsoft, the Air Force, the Navy, um, even Ernst & Young. And she's a member of the National Speakers Association and the International Positive Psychology Association. And she's a big believer in short introductions. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Ms. Jennifer Webb. Jennifer? Thank you. Okay. All of us, to a degree, are optimists. In fact, the Dalai Lama reminded us to choose to be optimistic. It feels better. And man, there has never been a better time to be optimistic. People need heroes. So I would like to share with you for the next few minutes, and I'm very happy that you are here with me, um, ideas on how to motivate ourselves, how to motivate others, how to inspire people. Because as I said, this is the time they need it. So wherever you are, uh, wherever you are in your kitchen, in your um, bedroom, in your office, I want you to do exactly as I'm doing, okay? I want you to put your arm out like so and bring it up. Can you do that? Now, look at this. Put your index finger and your thumb together and put a lot of pressure on the fingernail and a lot of pressure on the knuckle. So keeping the center of your pressure, very quickly bring your hand to your chin. Now, I can't see you, but for many of you, I'm betting this is not your chin. You see, the mind is an amazing thing. Even though we know exactly where we want to go, man, is it easy to get sidetracked. And right now, in the middle of everything that's going on, we are so sidetracked. People are so sidetracked. We think 60,000 thoughts a day and 90% are repeats. And so think about this. We're habitual creatures and we're used to doing things a certain way and all of that has vanished. And so we need to start looking at how we can inspire and motivate other people to realize it's okay to be comfortable, a little comfortable getting uncomfortable. It's just the way it is right now. And to help motivate people that this new normal is okay. It won't change, but that it's okay the way it is. And it could offer us a variety of different opportunities. So I want you to think a second. Who has motivated you in the past? Was it a professor? Was it um, a boss? Was it a parent? Who inspired you? Was it a coach you had? Think of if you could kind of just take that and bottle it. Whatever that person said to you uh, made you feel. Now think about that. And if you would for a second, would you type in, if you can, uh, I'd like Atticus to read off a couple of the characteristics. What was it like? This one person who inspired you and motivated you. Maybe she had a vision of how amazing you were. Maybe somebody believed in you when nobody else did. Maybe somebody forced you to work harder or to see something from a different perspective. So I would love for you to think for just a second, 
one person that you really appreciate that they've been in your life because they certainly, they were your cheerleader in some way. Would you take a second right now and type that out and send it to Atticus? And Atticus, let me know if we've got anything coming in because there's so many different ways that we can motivate. And I have a handout. In fact, we're going to start talking pretty soon about five rules to motivate. But I'd love to hear anything from you first. Now, it was interesting, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, they did research on him. How was he so inspiring to bring people together? And it was because he would talk about where we are now and where we're going to be. And he had this vision and he pulled people back and forth. And that's what we have to do. Yes, here's where we are now. Man, if we got issues, but here's where we're going to be. We're going to be smarter, tougher, stronger, more effective, better afterwards. And so it's going back and forth. So Atticus, do I have anything? Has anybody written anything for me? Yeah, no, uh, the first comment we got was about the CEO of uh, the Greater Gainesville Chamber <laughs> talking about how he's the ultimate cheerleader and cheering people on. Okay, and this is a time we need cheerleaders, no question. Somebody that sees, they can see the problems and the challenges, but at the same time, they believe in us and where we're going. Do we have others before we move on? Cynthia mentioned that her, her positive influence is someone who acknowledges that failure is okay. Um, that it's oh. a learning point and that it's always positive. Melanie Absolutely. said, someone who went through something I went through, but they were already on the other side. They could encourage me that I could make it. You're not going to be stuck here forever. It's, people need hope. And when we can offer them any kind of hope, that is priceless. That's worth, we're worth our weight in platinum, not even gold. Any others before we move on? Holly said, sorry, uh, a GM from Marriott in D.C. Um, oh, she didn't give any traits quite yet, though, but it sounds like he inspired her. Okay, that's cool. Uh, you know, keep reading because in, interrupt me at some point, and I'd like to hear if anybody else thinks of somebody while we're talking that was really inspirational and you'd like to share that with us. So if you've got your handout, we're going to start working with it. If you don't have your handout, you can certainly download it after this is over. I have I'd like to share five rules on positive persuasion. And rule number one, you ready? In order to influence others, we've got to first believe it ourselves and see a better future, which of course is all about attitude. It's never what happens to us, it's what we choose to do about it. Misery is optional, so is joy, and I am convinced that happiness is a skill and a choice. So years ago, Dinah Washington sang a song, What a Difference a Day Makes. And it reminds us that this is temporary. The good and the bad are always temporary because change is always happening. So as one of the people just wrote in to remind you, maybe here's where I am now, but I'm not going to stay. And as in the, the Dinah Washington song, What a Difference a Day Makes, we have absolutely no idea what's coming tomorrow. What inspiration, what connection, what idea, what's going to happen to help us be even more effective and handle everything better. So some tools on how to first believe in our better future, because you know, as well as I do, if I don't believe it, there's just no way I can convince, inspire, motivate anybody else. First, the acronym E plus R equals O. The event plus the response equals the outcome. I had a friend years ago when I lived in Nevada who had a son who got turned down by three major universities the same day. And a normal kid would go, life is over. And he told his mom, isn't it amazing? Three major universities made such a bad mistake the same day. True. He went on to Ohio State. He graduated in three years. He went on to Harvard Law School and got to turn down one of the universities that had initially turned him down. Another reason why it is so important right now, wherever you are listening to this, is to focus on how we're feeling, is because how you feel is probably more contagious than this virus that's going on. We have something called mirror neurons. If we're connected, the family that's with you right now, the colleagues that you're uh, meeting with over virtual meetings, the neighbor that you walk your dog by in the morning, if you have a connection with this person and you are feeling blah, they're going to pick it up. And if you are feeling hopeful, optimistic, man, I'm going to overcome this. Things are getting better. 
they're going to pick that up too. It's called mirror neurons. My neurons are going to mirror how you're feeling if we have any kind of close connection. So it's our responsibility, even if we don't want to, to look at ways that we can feel good. Help people have a purpose now more than ever. What can they focus on? How can I focus? What can I do that after this new normal is back to a more uh, regular normal. Uh, what have I accomplished? Viktor Frankl wrote perhaps the most amazing book on motivation ever, Man's Search for Meaning. He was a Jewish psychiatrist, German concentration camp, and he observed the people who lived had purpose. They would say things like, I've got to survive to see whether my daughter is still living. People who didn't have a purpose would say things like, why bother? I just don't need to wake up in the morning. And so the incredible importance of having a purpose. Watch out for ants. Automatic negative thought syndrome. Man, if I wake up in the morning and I go, oh, I just don't know if I can do this today. Argue against that belief because we have the ability. Of course I can. You know, I'm getting smarter and more effective and I'm learning something different just by being here. Automatic negative thought syndrome, argue against it. There's a fascinating book called The Biology of Belief that says, written by a cellular biologist who says from a cellular level on, we have control over how we feel. And it's a fascinating book, so it reminds us, I can choose. Happiness is a skill and a choice. Now, here's an interesting acronym that I've come up with called BIDI, or BIDI, B-I-D-I. And bear with me, it may sound kind of strange to you, but eh, at least think about it. When you are annoyed with somebody, the neighbor who's complaining, the car that cuts you off when you finally drive out someplace, or whatever it might be, um, somebody in your family because you've been sheltered with them for a long, long time, when you get frustrated with somebody, might I suggest a different approach? Bless it and drop it. And by bless it, I mean genuinely focus positive energy on that person. Uh, not, okay, I bless him. But I really hope that this is a wonderful day for you. And if you can't do that because this person is really too challenging, how about something like, you know, I really bless the fact that you're teaching me because I'm gonna be a stronger person when I learn not to be annoyed with you. The point is not to hold on to it because we want to make smart choices. Otherwise, it saps our energy. And we don't have enough energy to waste on frustrating, annoying people of any sort. Be the model. How we respond to and handle failure. Just talking about failure a few minutes ago is one of the, um, the, the positive mentors or um, positive attributes or characteristics. Listen to this, J.K. Rowling said failure, for her it was poverty, broken marriage, stripped away everything that was inessential. Steve Jobs said being fired from the company he founded ultimately proved a portal to a better life. Now, if I could see you right now, imagine I can, I'm gonna ask you how many of you have ever failed at something? Yeah? How many of you learned something really beneficial from that failure? So we know that as we're motivating other people, again, we heard it in the, in the opening a second ago, a few minutes ago, understand the power of failing is okay. What can I learn from it and then move on? <laughs> I have had so many failures. I was trying to figure out that I wanna mention one um, at the luncheon today, our virtual luncheon. And I was thinking, well, when I started speaking, I use magic when I speak, many of you uh, that I'm, talking to you today, I'm sure have watched me do something. Well, when I first began speaking, I was nervous. And especially when I was using magic and I'm and speaking in front of 300 cardiologists, okay? And I'm doing a rope trick where I take the rope and I cut it and I bring it back together again. Only somebody called my name. And so when they called my name and I was being rigid, you know, if you're an athlete or a musician or any number of things, you can't perform when you're rigid. And so I turned and the rope and this thumb switch places. And I sliced the top of this thumb off. It was dangling by this corner in front of 300 cardiologists. And my first thought was, this is so embarrassing. Maybe they won't notice. It's very unprofessional. Of course, they notice. And um, there's a 
pool of blood in the floor and the rope was turning red. And one of the doctors said, go in the bathroom and put your thumb under hot water. And I, I can't tell you how embarrassed I was. I got off the stage. I'm going to the bathroom. It was stage left. And I'm in there and I can't look at blood. So I'm looking like this. And uh, this, I have my thumb under hot water. And the woman said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to stop the bleeding. She said, so put it under cold water. I went, no, no, no. Uh, the doctor said, she said, no, if you have a heart attack, ask him. I'm a nurse. I put it under the cold water, stopped bleeding, wrapped it up with tape, went out and did the program. And I remember thinking, should I give up? Because this is just about the worst thing anybody can do. But I didn't. But I have tons of failures. And I'll tell you, I learn more from the failures than I ever do from the success stories. Note, resilient thinkers, that's who we are, have an internal locus of control, which, as you know, means we think that we not everything out there, not the circumstances, but we affect our achievements. The non-resilient people think it's everything out there. It's the virus. It's the government. It's my family. It's the boss. It's the circumstances that they affect everything, that everything else is affected. We have no control. Perception is also key. Even if we start to react, again, we can turn around and argue against those ants and remind ourselves our perception of something is making it happen. Let me give you an example. Two people are laid off because of COVID-19. One says, of course it was inevitable I was gonna get laid off because we had to close, but once we open, I'm sure I'll get my job back. And you know, even if I don't, I have so many connections in this town and I have such good credentials, I'll be fine. The other person with the same credentials says it was inevitable I'd get laid off. Oh, and you know, with the economy and things are the way, I have no idea when I'll ever get back to work. So my perception of something is going to make it happen. So I have to first focus on believing that the future is better if I'm going to inspire other people. Okay. Next, rule two, look for new opportunities and help others see them. Einstein said imagination is more powerful than knowledge. And right now, we've got to look at ways that different directions, right? Innovation is thinking in new patterns. How would somebody else do this? Napoleon Hill wrote a book years ago called Think and Grow Rich. And in it, he said that he had a committee before bed every night that would help him solve problems. This committee, because we're talking about how would others do it, this committee was Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Edison, I don't remember the others, but he would ask them and then they would help him come up with better answers. Now, not for a second do I believe he channeled the spirits of old dead men. What I think he did was think of how they might handle it and start to look at different opportunities, different directions. He said it became so real, it became spooky. And he, he finally dismantled it when Abraham Lincoln came in once and started pacing and Edison and Franklin were getting in an argument with each other. He said, oh, it's almost like they're really here. Uh, who could give you new ideas? Do you choose to mind map? Do you choose to do something entirely new? Do you ask yourself, how would Lady Gaga handle my issue? How would my favorite professor, how would my grandmother? So it's looking at other, other places, other directions in order to get new ideas. Use smart questions. If you're getting other people involved, uh, have you ever thought, tell me more, etc. And realize that we all have genius potential. The trick, and some people say, is to start thinking more like a child. Now, I want to make sure, I'm going to put, hold this really close to the camera, make sure you can see this. This should be, if you can see this, a red dot. So. Where you are right now, if I said, what do you think this is other than a red dot? You might say circle, period. That's usually what I get, circle, period, dot. Uh, somewhere I was speaking in Texas and somebody said bullet hole, but usually a circle, dot, or period. Guess what a group of six-year-olds said? Belly button, small planet, Rudolph's nose in a snowstorm, squash ladybug, and on and on and on. So how would a child look at changing, learning, growing right now? 
I want to read something to you, and I normally don't read when I'm speaking, but this is so fascinating. And again, it's in your handout. In 1968, George Land gave 1,600 five-year-old children, <coughs> excuse me, creativity tests, because he, it's the same test that he had given to NASA to select innovative engineers and scientists, right? So he retested the same children when they were 10, when they were 15, and then he took a separate group of adults when they were 25 years and older. So listen to this. The children that were five years old, 1,600 of them, this is in 1968, scored 98% in the ability to be incredible, almost genius level creative. When the same children were 10, they scored 30%. When the same children were 15, they scored 12%. The adults, over 25, 2%. So what did he conclude? We have to learn to judge less. See, that, that goes back to my blessing suggestion because if I'm blessing or being kind to somebody, I can't be judging them. I need to understand more, I need to criticize less, and I need to be curious more, which is probably one of the main traits of childhood. And I must challenge my belief system. So we need to start thinking in non-traditional ways. So, Rule number three, tell people what they're doing right and savor or appreciate where you are right now. Now, these are two very different ideas. So let's go with the first one, tell people what they're doing right. Less than 60% of the American workforce is ever even told, thank you. It costs nothing. It costs nothing to tell your partner, your spouse, your friend, your child, um, anybody. I appreciate your smile. I appreciate you checking on me. I appreciate you saying hi from a distance or whatever it might be. I appreciate the breakfast you made for me this morning. Corey Bateman uh, was the first creator of electronic send cards and he called his company, I think, they were, I think it's Send Out Cards. So Corey, I heard Corey speak once and he said the reason he started this company is that he was uh, moving from one place in Utah to another and his brother helped him pack. So he had this moving truck and it was filled and he was ready to go and his brother was there and he was in the truck already and he had this overwhelming desire to get down, hug the brother. But first he's a guy, second he was late. So he honked, waved, took off. His brother was killed in a work-related accident the next month. And he said, I am never going to let a day go by that I do not thank people in my life. And I'm going to make it easy for other people to thank people in their lives. And so he started Send Out Cards. So I was doing a half-day workshop at the University of Florida about six, eight months ago. And I had a woman that came up at the break. It was half day, so we took a break about halfway in between. And she said, thank you for mentioning that. She said, my son was killed by a drunken driver last year, but I will not regret the fact that we spoke. I have no regrets on how often I told him I loved him and how often we spoke. And so whether it's family, whether it's friends, it's reminding ourselves to tell people we appreciate. I'm asking you to think about, and you don't have to type this in, but I'd like you to think about five people that you can contact after this virtual luncheon is over and just tell them, it could be an email, it could be a text, it could be a phone call, it could be any way that you want to communicate with them. Tell them that you appreciate them. And if not today, maybe tonight, and if not tonight, sometime very soon. Pay attention to the part that shines. Let me explain what this means. Uh, Carnegie, during his era, made more men, no women for some reason, but more men millionaires than anyone. And he was interviewed. How do you do it? And he said, it's very simple. It's like digging for gold. You've got to dig past the part to the part that shines. Dig past the dirt to the part that shines. So think about when you are motivating, inspiring other people, they may appear uh, frustrating, micromanaging, difficult, challenging in a jillion different ways. What if you dug past the dirt to the part that shone? Because you already do it. If we had a whole day together and we could hear each other and you could talk about, let me explain. I have a son who is dyslexic and he had terrible problems in school. He couldn't read and you know, kids 
can be unkind and they made fun of him because he couldn't read. And he, he was miserable. I took him to a neurologist out in Great Neck, Long Island, who did a battery of tests on my son. We lived in New York at the time. So now he takes me aside from Michael Kant here. And he said, send him to a nice vocational school. He is not smart enough for college. And I remembered thinking, oh, you have no idea how smart my son is. He was actually interpreting Egyptian hieroglyphics at a junior museum, but he couldn't read. And I thought, I'm going to wait as long as I can before I tell Michael he is not smart enough for college. So after he got his master's in forensic science and a four point um, and a scholarship to Oxford, I told him what the expert had said. But the point is, I could see past the dirt to the part that's shown. The more we start doing this, because we're not going to be sheltered forever, whether you back out there with other people, and they're going to frustrate us. It's called human nature. If I can suspend judgment and look for the part that shines, it has amazing results as far as how we motivate, how we inspire. Now, to the other part, savor and appreciate. What's going well today? Is it the smell of coffee? Did anybody get up early? I get up at 4.30 and I saw the, looked like a full moon this morning and it was breathtakingly beautiful. What can we savor and appreciate right now? Uh, maybe that you're in this meeting and not wearing pants. I don't know. You know, we can appreciate all kinds of little things, right? So the savoring has a great deal to do with, again, how we're feeling and how we're feeling is what we are going to pass on to others. Rule number four out of my five rules, know what people need and speak in their language. Okay, we all know about emotional and social intelligence, of course. It's controlling how I'm going to respond, but even more important, it's truly understanding what other people need. And I gotta tell you, I know the people that are listening to me, looking at me right now, know emotional intelligence but there are jillions of people who don't have a clue. And we know we call that people skills. And we know employees around, employers, excuse me, around the country are going to hire on people skills versus other skills because there's so many qualified, educated, experienced people. But if they can't get along with each other, we don't want them. It doesn't take that much to pause and look to see what does this person need and give it to them. Let me give you an example of what emotional intelligence is not. I was working in Reno, Nevada, maybe a year ago, and I injured my leg running. And so I found a place to get a massage. And I thought, great, you know, it'll help my leg. And as soon as I, I had no idea who the person was, she got in the room and I said, you know, uh, my leg here, and I'm pointing, is, uh, is injured. I'd really appreciate it, anything you can do. And she said, oh, I'm not working on that. It looks like it's inflamed. And I went, oh, well, okay. Could you tell me what it is? Is it a tendon, a muscle? Oh, I don't know. I didn't learn that much anatomy, just enough to get my license. I'm going, this woman's terrible. And then she followed up with, and you know, you've got some spider veins and those could be had blood clots. I'm not working on those either. And I remembered saying, well, if there's anything that you could work on, would you please? And I thought she is so bad, I'm going to remember and use her as an example, because it would have taken no more words if we were paying for the words to have said something like, well, ma'am, I think we'll work around this. But I, in fact, if it doesn't get better, you might consider going to a doctor. Now relax, I want you to have a wonderful experience. What did I need and what did she say? Couldn't have been farther apart. Uh, so, listen to really understand first. We know Covey reminded us, listen to understand, but it is so easy, isn't it, to want to jump in uh, when somebody comes up for air. There are a lot of good ways to truly listen. One is to close your eyes. Now, it's really tough if you're in a meeting and you're seeing, you could do that now because we can't see you. But if we're in, let's say, a Zoom meeting and I can look at you and you're going, okay, yeah, I'm thinking, you're falling asleep, you're not happy, what have you. However, with your eyes closed, it blocks out so many other things that we can truly hear more effectively. If I listen for the nuances, if I listen between the lines, if I listen to have to share with someone else, keep people safe and give them autonomy. 
we know everybody wants to do things their way. And by keeping people safe, of course, simply ensuring that they can say whatever they need. I remember um, once having a woman in one of my classes and she said she sat in front of the CEO's office and people would come in and go. And the days she would go, they would talk to her. The days that she would go, they didn't talk to her. So the point is that the female CEO, the point is making it safe all the time for people to bring bad news, to have questions, whatever it might be and to be heard. There's a wonderful book, you've probably read it, called Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And in it, um, Patrick Lencioni, I believe, talks about the importance of helping people feel safe everywhere and making it okay to disagree. You know, conflict isn't bad as long as we do it with respect and everybody feels heard. Don't forget, what's in it for me? This is how people always are thinking. And so it's, it's human nature. If I want to get you to listen, if I want to get you to do something, I need to come at you from, communicate from, what's in it for me? If we were out in the real world again, and we all were at a restaurant having lunch today, and then we all had to go our separate ways and we were in a hurry, and as we left, the manager came out and said, excuse me, excuse me, could you please fill out this three-question survey? We want to know how our customer service was. We'd say no. Got lots to do. It was great. However, if that same person ran out and said, $5 coupon, the next time you come back, if you'll fill out these three questions, we would probably say, what's three questions? It's no big deal. What's in it for me? And don't forget, treat people the way they want to be treated. Now, I know that you're aware of personality differences. I know. Everybody out there is. We have so many different, we've got Myers-Briggs, we've got DISC, we've got a variety. But I want to remind you, when we're looking at how we motivate people, we have to speak to them in their language. So if you've got the D and disc that dominate, no nonsense, cut to the chase, bottom line, you just have got to talk to her or to him. Because if I just finished reading um, Norman, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, The Power of Positive Thinking, and I try to go in and be friendly and go, well, tell me what you've been doing during this time you've been sheltered. What are your hobbies or whatever it would be? This person would be annoyed as, I don't know, with me. So I need to treat the no-nonsense, cut-to-the-chase, bottom-line person exactly like that. Don't waste his time, don't waste your time, and don't take away her control. Really important. On the other hand, if I've got the individual who really needs to talk, who really needs interaction, who is spontaneous and fun and glasses half full, if I try, because I have a busy day, I've got five virtual meetings and all kinds of deadlines, and this person wants to chat and I try to cut her off, it's not going to work. I have to go back to Covey who reminds us we have to make deposits before we get withdrawals. And so I'm going to have to go, hey, how are you doing today? What's been going on? And talk to her for a minute or two. Yes, it may seem like you're a little disingenuous, but again, it's talking to her in her language. And another quick reminder, if you've got the other two, if you've got the more quiet, introverted, let me just be part of the team person, listen with your eyes and ears with that person. Uh, let their ideas come how they feel comfortable. In other words, don't try to put them in another category. And finally, the good old analytical people, don't try to push them. Assume and understand that they behave in a certain way because that is how they're wired. So finally, the last Rule, communicate trust and kindness. Nonverbal communication is really important. Even virtually, nonverbal communication is important. I made an impression on you within probably five seconds. And again, 55% well, is visual and I'm just a little picture on a screen. It does translate, it comes through. Do I lean in when I'm talking? Do I have enough energy? Do I make sure I don't close anything off? Do I look into that little light, that little camera that's at the top of my laptop? Because if I look somewhere else, if I'm down reading, if I'm doing something else, it's not going to work. Nonverbals are important any place. They're huge. 55% is visual. 38% of the impression I made electronically 
through what we're, how we're communicating today is tone, is sound. Do I have enough energy? Do I not go up at the end of the sentence unless I'm asking you a question? I asked a woman a price quote the other day and she said, um, $250? And I didn't hire her because I didn't think she believed very strongly in what she was saying. So we want to pay attention even more than when you're face to face, how your nonverbals impact when you're doing it virtually, when you're doing it electronically. And here's something to pay attention to as well. Let's say you are really serious and you're focusing on a meeting and it's a virtual meeting. And so you've got your serious face on and your serious face is usually a resting face. And so with a resting face, you might appear angry, scowling, something negative for sure. So look at yourself in the camera. Look at yourself, make sure you don't have that scowling, unapproachable resting face, which just means that you're serious and you're concerned and you're thinking about it, but it turns people away. So think about something that makes you feel good. A child, for me, it's usually my Cocker Spaniel and it softens me. I can still be whatever I need to be, but I am approachable. Another reason why the nonverbals are so important is because we connect with people more effectively and more quickly when we feel like we have a commonality. If I'm suddenly, well, I wouldn't be now, let's say last year I was suddenly in Europe by myself um, and suddenly I saw two people, heard two people speaking English and I'm going, oh yes, we have something in common and I go ask them if they want to have a glass of wine with me and if I saw them in Gainesville, I would probably not even cross the street to say hello, but where I was, there was a commonality. So how can I be more close to people from a nonverbal? I pick up how quickly, how slowly they talk, the energy, etc. And so people say, you know, we're on the same wavelength. They find something in common. I'll give you a quick example of the importance of this, uh, this matching somebody else's energy. Um, years ago, so many years ago, they did not even have cell phones. I am at an airport getting ready to board a plane and there's a group of round pay phones and I'm on one of them waiting to leave a message and I can see my plane diagonally across boarding. And this man, Robert Snorbus, had his machine on and he was saying, I don't know where he is today, it'd be fun to find him. Anyhow, he said, his machine said, hello, this is Robert Snorbus. Please leave your name. Oh. Really, and finally, his message goes beep, and I go, hello, this is Jennifer Webb, Magic Communications. And if you'd been there, you'd have said, oh, you are making fun of him. No, I am matching his style. He called me back later, we talked for under 60 seconds because his people had already vetted me and he hired me. But there was something about me he liked. So again, communicate with trust and kindness, and we want people to trust us, so we want to find we want them to find a commonality. Empathetic listening, empathetic language, sounds as if this is important. Also, especially now when we've got so much on our plate, remember the acronym HALT. Don't open the virtual meeting, don't pick up the phone, don't send the email if you are hungry, angry, late, or tired. You will probably regret it. <clears throat> this is speaking from somebody who has done just that in the past and have learned and have regretted it. So pay attention to how we're feeling and use that as a guide. And remember, we've heard this before, but it's so important right now, people don't care how much you know when they know how much you care. So I wanna read something the Irish poet, John O'Donohue said, may there be kindness in your gaze when you look within. And so the point there is, no matter what's going on, please be kind to yourself. Because I started off by talking about, I've got to have the belief that I want, if I'm going to translate it, if I'm going to motivate, if I'm going to influence and inspire others. And so I've also got to be kind to myself to let go of anything that I might have done wrong. There was a Vietnam vet named John McCleary, who does wonderful motivational speaking, 
And he talks about this acronym that I have talked about in the past from time to time called FIDO. And I want to mention it here because basically what it stands for is to remember to forget it and drive on or forgive it and drive on. So regardless of what happened before about 18 minutes to the hour, we have no control over it anymore. But we can choose to let go and not hold on because if we do, it's not going to get us anywhere. So that is where we are kind to ourselves. And finally, courage is something that all of us need right now. And maybe it's courage to be the leader. Maybe it's courage to even be the follower. They're both incredibly important. I saw a National Geographic special a while back, and I actually turned it off. And then later, when someone told me that it had a happy ending, I turned it back or rewatched it. But it showed a herd of water buffalo. And they were towering these enormous big animals to one side. And there was a pride of lions that were attacking a calf, one of their calves. And then suddenly, this was amazing. Suddenly, one water buffalo, one animal, walked out away from the herd. He kind of looked to see if anybody was going to follow him. And he went over and he started uh, using his horns to get the lions off the calf. But it took a second one. Then the second water buffalo came, still nobody else, came out, looked to see if anybody was going to help, walked over to help the first. After that, the whole herd came over. The lions ran away, and we were told that the calf lived. The point is, it takes courage to be the first one. It takes a great deal of courage to be the second one. And that's where we have to go back and remember to get comfortable being a little uncomfortable right now. Malcolm Gladwell, in his wonderful book, uh, The Tipping Point, talked about, you know, it just takes a few people to create an amazing change. What you are doing right now will have an amazing impact on everybody around you. So I left enough time that I wanted you to be able to type in, uh, in a second, to Atticus, any comments, any questions? Well, first, I'm going to ask you to, uh, what your gift was. But at the same time, because we're virtual, I left enough time for you to ask any questions that you might have about what we've talked about, but not yet. Here's what I want you to do first. I want you to put your hands together and simply look to see which thumb is on top and which pinky is on the bottom. Would you do that for me, please? OK. Now, I want you to take them apart. And I want you to put the opposite thumb on the top and the opposite pinky on the bottom. And how does it feel? Probably you are thinking or you're saying out loud, oh, a little weird or strange or uncomfortable as we deal with this new normal. It is strange. It is uncomfortable. But you can inspire and motivate other people to go, sure, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> we can get through it. It doesn't have to feel perfect all the time. And, you know, it was Will Rogers that said, even if you're on the right track, you're going to get run over if you just sit there. So our job, my job, your job, is to encourage people. What one thing can you do? I love the acronym SOS, a series of small successes. What one thing can I do today that I haven't done so far that's going to turn around and maybe in a small way, maybe exponentially, change how my life is going? So I want you, if you'd be gracious enough, right where you are, to think of one gift. What was one thing I said? Maybe it's something that you speak about all the time. Maybe it's something that you teach. Maybe it's something that you haven't heard. Maybe it's a version of something. Would you be gracious enough to type out what was the gift of our time here? And after that, on the same, uh, the same thing that you type, if you have any questions, because this would normally be the Q&A part of the program, you would have finished eating, uh, you would perhaps be having, if, if we had pizza, you'd be done with the pizza. If we had something else, you might be having some coffee right now. So this is the time when if you have any questions that you would like to uh, ask, I would love to hear them. But please be gracious enough, I really would love it, if you would tell me what was the one gift, what was the thing that I said that can be useful, are beneficial that you will take away after today. And so I'm going to wait to hear what Atticus 
uh, reads and if you'll be kind enough to read them off. And again, any questions? It looks like we've got about 11 minutes uh, for questions and answers. I think we could squeeze in that much time if you have any. So let me know. Well Okay. While we wait for questions, I thought that I would just share with you real quick that um, when you had mentioned thinking of five people um, that you could share your appreciation for, I went ahead and pulled and asked people to check in when they thought of those five people. And then I was going to ask, them, thank you. 92% <laughs> of them checked in and said that, uh, that, they, that they have and that they're going to do it afterwards. Um, yes, I love it. Thank you. Well, if I could hear of, you, I was going to ask you... Um, what those five people were. So I'm very happy you're going to do it. It's amazing. You know, we have no idea what tomorrow brings, but just to be able to say, man, I appreciate you in my life. And it doesn't have to be an incredibly significant person. It could be the person who mows your yard or the person who walks by every morning and just happens to smile when they see you. Okay. What do we have? Uh, so Cynthia mentioned that your energy really brightened her day and she really appreciates your enthusiasm. Thank you. Okay. Holly said that she loves the, the bitty or bitey acronym quite a lot. <laughs> well, I, I think of, you know, old bitty and I went, no, 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 no. That's, that's putting a whole negative cast on the whole thing. But it's, <laughs> by the way, that comes, that, not the acronym, but the idea comes from an incredible book called The Gentle Art of Blessing. Because there are people like me that are very easy to judge everybody and everything. You know, there's my way and then there's uh, everybody else's way. And it doesn't get me anywhere. And so it's really shifting a paradigm in how I think I am much more effective and get out of my ego that everybody should do it my way. So it's, it's a book worth picking up. Thank you. What else do we have? Melanie had uh, mentioned the looking past the dirt to see the part that shines. There's so many amazing people and they might be introverts. They might be quiet. They might not be the way we think a hero should be or a successful person and we can get past our concept of what somebody should look like or how they should behave. Um, we can see some amazing people and you might be the only person that sees that goodness in somebody and turn around and change them completely and then we don't know who they will change. So it's, it's an ongoing process. Do we have any others? Sure. Willow said, Speak their language by matching their energy or mannerisms. Also, people don't care what you know if they know how much you care. Really resonated with me in this season of life. We don't have to have the answers. We just have to have the care, have to care and try. It's huge. Yes. And we don't all have the answers. We don't all know everything. But caring about what somebody needs and connecting them with somebody that does have the answers or at least working on trying to get them, that's enough. I mean, yes, eventually they, they need what they need, but knowing that you care to help them is enormous, maybe more than the answer, actually. Do we have others? Yeah, Meg from Relax Salt Rooms said, bless it and drop it is my new favorite saying. <laughs> Good job on this today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, please use it because it's so easy to get stuck in <sighs> being annoyed. And then every time I go by that person, I'm, even, I'm more annoyed and I can't sleep at night because I'm still thinking about that person. And it gets me nowhere. In fact, there are so many people that if you give them half a glass of wine or a beer, they'll tell you about somebody that got a bigger cubicle three years ago or somebody that said something, a snide remark in a meeting two years ago. And it's like their hobby. They pick it back up and think of what it does to their energy. We don't have enough energy to stay angry at anybody or be annoyed with anybody. Our job is to focus on helping ourselves and helping others. And again, being the person that makes a difference. It, Gladwell, I'll repeat, it takes just a very few people to make an incredible difference in the world. And by the way, if you read The Tipping Point, you might remember one of the interesting multitude of examples that he used was uh, hush puppies were a shoe that was no longer being uh, manufactured, or very few. And so they, the company was going to drop that particular shoe and then a few NYU students in Manhattan started wearing them. They weren't paid to advertise, but because other NYU students said, ooh, can I try those on? What are those? They ended up manufacturing 900,000 pairs that year and did not drop the brand. It takes just a few people with the right attitude to impact 
everybody in the area, everybody in your company, everybody on your team, and they might even know, not know how and why they are feeling differently. So we have a great responsibility. So um, I didn't want to talk over other responses. Do we have other uh, uh, other information? Oh, yeah, we have we have quite a few, and uh, I think Mary's okay. is incredibly sweet. Um, the main gift is the gift of your time. Thank you for providing guidance on how to respond to challenging people by considering their personality type, mirroring, mirroring, and what they need. It's not easy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Linda said, just because the situation is uncomfortable, it doesn't mean we can't get through it. And Christy said, I appreciate that you reminded us that it takes courage to be, to be the first. It is easy to forget from time to time how great our strengths actually are and or the amount of time, courage, amount, sorry, and or the amount of courage we have within to take the lead or take the first steps. Just you taking the first step. It's amazing how many other people were almost ready, but they weren't going to do it unless you did. It's incredibly important. Thank you. Do we have any others? No, that's it for now. Um, and I want to thank you so much. We're not getting any questions, and I suspect that's because you've been so thorough. Well, then, I think, uh, do I, Steve, do you want to end our time? And I, again, thank you so much. And I'm going to remind you again, Will Rogers. Okay, even if we're on the right track, we're going to get run over if we just sit there. So please take one thing from our time together that can be beneficial to you or remind you to continue doing. Uh, have a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much for your time. And Steve, take it away. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I appreciate you. And I, appreciate I appreciate you. And I appreciate you being here with us today. Um, uh, today, we're all learning how to look at things differently, right? Uh, both at home and at the workplace. Um, our routines have changed, and we are all learning together uh, what the future is going to bring for us and how we're going to do things. Uh, we've been working real hard at the Chamber here to keep our community informed as we get through this together. And I believe uh, working together with a focused, positive lens, I think we'll get through this a lot stronger as a community. Uh, thank you again, Jennifer, for, for taking the time and sharing your wisdom with us today. Uh, Frank, thank you, and Carl Riggs and Ingram for sponsoring us. And I just want to uh, thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you staying positive and moving forward as we get to restart our local economy here in Gainesville. Uh, we appreciate your support. And uh, stay well, everyone, and reach out to us if you need anything.